Hello everyone. Good evening. Welcome to today's session. I hope I am. Uh, my audio is clear, and you know, we, the slides are also clear to you. Okay. So uh, once again, welcome back to Madhav Shankar classes. I am Madhav Shankar Arvarya, and we are currently continuing with our UPSC CSC Medieval India Old NCRT History Textbook. Okay. So today is the fourth. Uh, lecture on this series. We have already completed modern India. Uh, now we are doing the medieval and later on we will be taking uh, ancient India as well followed by art and culture. Okay. So uh, in the first three lessons we saw what was happening uh, in the medieval you know, earlier portion of medieval India. We looked into the world picture. We looked into certain Southeast Asian nations, certain you know Middle Eastern nations etc etc. Uh, then we saw what was happening within India, for example, you know, the tripartite struggle and, you know, associated conflicts and all. We saw some, you know, uh, certain kinds of temple building, the Cholas, etc., their naval power, Palas, etc., all these things. Okay, so today we are actually moving on to uh, the next phase in medieval India, that is the arrival of Turks. Okay, so we have to have a very brief history about what was happening in the Persian and Turkish region or in the Central Asian region at that time. What was going on? Why did the Arabs, uh, sorry, why did the uh, Turks come to India? How did they establish power, etc., etc. So today again, we are. I am taking only one chapter. So uh, after today, I mean, from the next class onwards, uh, we will see that start of Delhi Sultanate. Okay. So how did the Delhi Sultanate happen in India, or what led to the foundation of Delhi Sultanate or the slave dynasty, the first dynasty uh, in the Delhi Sultanate? Okay, so how did Kutubuddin Aibak establish his power in India? So that has a precedent. Okay, that has not precedent. That has a history. So that is what we are going to see today. Okay, it, does, it did not happen overnight. There were plenty of political and economic causes that led to all that. Okay, so in today's class, uh, which will be comparatively shorter, uh, we will be like looking into the age of conflict. Okay, from 1080 to 1280. So in the previous class, I told you, I mean, uh, we have taken the economic and social situations all the way from 800 to 1280 together in the previous class, lecture three. Okay. But we had, you know, uh, compartmentalized the political history into two parts from 800 to 1000 and 1000 to 1200. So this was already done uh, in lecture two and we are doing this part today. Okay. So the age of conflict uh, circa 1000 to 1200. So from 1206 onwards, we see the establishment of Elhi Sultanate. Kutubuddin Aibak starting the you know, slave dynasty and all. And we will look into uh, how it proceeded in the upcoming sessions. So once again, welcome all of you. Welcome Sashank. Welcome Satya. Good evening. Uh, if you have any queries in between, please feel free to ask. You can put it in the YouTube live chat. I will look into it. If I know the answer, I will immediately get back to you. Otherwise, we, I will you know, check it out and tell you the answer in the next class. Okay. So I will be looking into the YouTube live session after about a couple of each two slides or something like that. Okay. So uh, yeah, one more thing. If you have not already subscribed to this channel, please do so. I will be uploading the class notes, PDFs, etc. into my Telegram channel. The link is given here or in you know, below the YouTube description session. Please uh, subscribe to that to get the PDFs of all these things. Okay, so let's start. So what were the political changes that were happening across the world, especially I mean in Asia uh, between 1080 to 1280? Okay, plenty of changes were going on, especially in West and Central Asia, which was simultaneously progressing with North Indian situation. Okay, lots of things were happening all across the world. We cannot study each and every detail. So we have to have a general picture. So certain things were happening in Western Asia and Central Asia politically. Similarly, North India was also in a very, uh, you know, uh, uh, undergoing various kinds of changes. So all these, okay, what, all the, what are all these? We will look into in this chapter. But all these changes or all these happenings actually led to the incursion of Turks into Northern India which led to the emergence of Delhi Sultanate. So in the Middle Eastern region or in the Central Asian region, the Abbasid Caliphate, we had studied about Abbasid Caliphate in the first lecture, if you remember. 
not too much important but just understand that it was uh, the uh, central asian region was ruled by abbasid caliphate so this dynasty or this power was undergoing decline okay and when such a mighty power undergoes decline someone else has to take its place correct and its place was actually taken by the 10 islamized turks not one single person okay such a large empire collapsed and it was not taken over by one individual person or one prominent dynasty but instead plenty of chieftains and you know small small rulers who, who were islamized turks they took over this vacuum created by the decline of abbasid caliphate so these new rulers they were not too powerful or anything so initially they called themselves as amir okay they started to you know call themselves as amirs in india also we saw similar things you know these chieftains and lords used to assume their own titles okay we saw some of such some such titles in the previous lesson so here amir was the initial title they gave to themselves but later on as they began to consolidate their power and to increase their power they themselves gave the title sultan sultan means essentially king or shah or ruler whatever okay so these small small kings and chieftains whoever managed to establish themselves began to be called as sultan so at that time plenty of you know uh, empires came up and it fell down as soon as it came up also because none of them were strong enough to establish a long lasting dynasty okay so this is the time when we need somebody who is very strong enough to build a very strong empire okay we need that someone who can consolidate his empire and build his empire and you know formulate a very large kingdom okay that vacuum was present in the indian scenario as well as in the central asian setup so the turkish tribesmen brought with them the you know their own habits okay plant uh, different kinds of rulers uh, you know administer themselves or does the expansion in different different ways for example when we study world history we study that adolf hitler who ruled germany he had this policy of expansion but his policy of expansion was more focused on conquering territories okay conquering important territories or bringing the old german territories back etc etc similarly when we study about say mughals or aurangzeb etc again we see this policy of expansion where aurangzeb tries to bring in uh, deccan to his reign and all shah jahan also had this policy etc but here the turkish tribesmen had a very particular policy okay they also did try to you know conquer different or, or wage war with different uh, neighboring countries and all but they never tried to you know they were, their idea was to ruthlessly plunder that area okay rather than trying to annex that territory into their empire they were more focused on plundering that region and amassing wealth looting and plundering that was the habit of turkish tribesmen at that time okay so the the method they wish in which they did this was you know they used to rapidly advance and they used to rapidly retreat okay it's like a skirmish very fast they will attack and once they attack and plunder they will immediately withdraw there is no staying back or anything okay they were basically lightning raids why i mean how did they manage to conduct that simple central asia had superior variety of horses we studied that in the earlier lesson okay the arabs for example the arabian region had very fine variety of horses superior quality it is unmatched by you know indian quality and uh, indian variety of horses so due to this advantage they were able to conduct all these lightning raids okay so in india at that time in the northern india the tripartite struggle had weakened almost all major powers and gurjara pratihara empire was basically you know declining and when they declined there was nobody to take over that power okay the gurjara pratiharas were one of the strongest powers palas were very strong pratihar similarly uh, uh, you know rashtrakutas were very strong but once they vanished in the northern india nobody managed to take up that vacuum okay there was utter confusion this happens almost everywhere in history whenever a large kingdom or empire breaks down there is often a period of confusion okay so uh, this empire broke down little attention was paid to the emergence of aggressive expansionist turk states 
on the northwestern border of India and in the west. So when this confusion happened, okay, when Gurjara Pratiharas collapsed and uh, everybody was, you know, in a confused state, oh, you know, who is to take over next, nobody actually paid attention to what was happening outside India. Okay, India's northwestern border has, you know, uh, land boundary with Arabian region. You know that, right? At those times, I mean, India means you know, the Indian subcontinent includes Pakistan and other regions also. You know that, the India proper. Okay, and this has a boundary that is essentially very close to Arabian region. So this boundary is very vital for whoever who wants to prevent some raids from Arabian region. Okay, but because nobody was in power in India at that time or was in that position in India at that time and a general attitude of confusion prevailed in North India, nobody paid attention to this particular border. Okay, so this is the time when Turks actually start to look into India. So uh, this region, this Peshawar, Lahore, you know, this region, this region had many Buddhists and Hindu shrines in this area. Okay, for example, one of the biggest Buddhist statues located in Bamiyan. Okay, it is the height is about 53.5 meters. It's a very colossal statue. Okay, it's located there. Similarly, plenty of caves for residents of monks were built in this region. Okay, so uh, this region had very, very good influence of Buddhism and Hinduism. Also, this region had plenty of tribal people. Okay, the local population was there. Along with that, tribesmen like Hunas, Turks, exiled Iranians, Indians such as the uh, Bhatti Rajputs, all were there. So, it was essentially these people now who were keeping the Arabs away from India. Okay, it was up to them because nobody else is there. It is a, there is a vacuum, political vacuum in India. So, it was up to these people to make sure that you no know, nobody enters into their territory and they were doing a fine job with that for a very long time okay and they were doing that why because as i have told you in the central asian region also the main dynasty collapsed and there were plenty of small kings who used to call them call themselves as amirs and later on sultans okay because so in both regions there are no powers enough to conquer the other that was the condition Okay, this is the time when we witness the emergence of a very powerful dynasty in the Central Asian region known as Ghaznavids. Okay, so from here onwards, we see that these Central Asian uh, tribesmen or Central Asian powers starts to look into India and due to various other factors that were going on in the Central Asian politics, uh, some of these dynasties had no choice but to expand towards India. And that is how actually Turks enter Indian subcontinent. Okay, so towards the end of 9th century, Transoxiana, Khurasan, and parts of Iran were being ruled by the Samanids. Okay, Samanids were basically Iranians by descent. Okay, don't worry about all these terms and all, just have an idea of all. Okay, I mean, these are not areas uh, you have to buy heart or anything, but understand the story. Okay, so basically, Samanids were. Uh, ruling over this region at this time and they had to battle continuously with almost all their neighbors especially non-muslim Turkish tribesmen okay these seven it's had to constantly wage wars and battles with most of their neighboring powers especially non-muslim uh, Turkish tribesmen okay in their southern and eastern frontiers so during these fights there are there is no you know organized large standing army okay there, there might be an army but mostly these fights were won using mercenary soldiers i think you if you have seen any historical hollywood film you would know what a mercenary is basically a mercenary is a person who can be hired okay it's a, like a soldier who can be hired in, in as well look at modern day states okay in india we have soldiers they cannot be hired for anything i mean they cannot be hired for fighting on behalf of someone else they fight for india the country the nation okay but in those times we had these mercenaries i mean whoever pays them more they will fight for them that's it okay whoever pays them more the mercenaries will fight for them so that's the kind of people who mercenaries were they were excellent soldiers except that they are loyal to whoever pays them more that's it okay so during these 
constant battles in the central asia a new kind of mercenary or a new kind of uh, fighter emerged named as khasi okay this type of mercenaries were who emerged around this time is known as khasis clear yeah? so they were excellent mercenaries and they were put to use in central asian wars so in course of time many turks started to become muslims okay as time progressed gradually uh, turkish people who were initially non muslims some of them started to convert to islam and they became muslims but the struggle renewed the incursions of non muslim turkish tribes uh, into various uh, other areas okay but although this happened still these incursions turkish non muslim turkish incursions into these regions continue so these people who converted to islam okay this islamized turks they were were to emerge as the greatest defenders and crusaders of islam okay later on uh, don't worry about that at this moment but you can you will see that after uh, this conversion has happened these people started to champion the cause of islam okay islam became a very uh, you know global and very much followed religion uh, due to the efforts taken by these people also okay these islamized turks started to become the defend greatest defenders of islam the religion but although this their love for this religion and their loyalty towards this religion continued the basic habit of plundering and looting their neighbors also continued in hand in hand okay, so uh, they were religious people now and they uh, defended islam and all but still their basic habit of plundering and looting you know went hand in hand with all their activities at this time a person called alp tijin basically he is a turkish slave okay don't worry about the name and all just understand okay alp tijin that's his name and he is a turkish slave he established an independent kingdom with its capital at ghazni clear so basically this person established his capital uh, uh, established an independent state with its capital at ghazni this is how you know the central asian politics starts to for you know get a clear shape now we you know you i think you have already heard about mahmud of ghazni and all who invades india plunders somnath temple and all so this is how the ghazni is you know uh, set up it is actually alp tijin who make you know lay, lay the foundations of this particular empire later on mahmud ascends the throne this is a very famous person mahmud of ghazni okay he comes into uh, power after some time and he ruled for about 32 years from 998 to 2030 and he is actually very closely associated with the renaissance of iranian spirit the iranian spirit i mean iranians are very proud people and all they never accepted arabic language or etc etc i mean they glorified their culture etc etc kian mahmud was one such person who was very closely associated with the renaissance of uh, islam uh, iranian spirit and the one of the highest watermarks in this time was basically firdausi's shahnama i think you have heard about this shahnama it's actually uh, written by firdausi and firdausi was a poet laureate in the court of mahmud of ghazni that is a prel prelims question okay firdausi is actually the court poet or poet laureate in the court of mahmud of ghazni okay so there was a resurgence in this is iranian patriotism and persian language and culture became the language and culture of ghaznavi empire is so much so that mahmud himself claimed to be the descendant of the legendary iranian king afrasia afrasia is one of the you know legendary iranian kings i mean just like we have ashoka chandragupta maurya etc or say just like we have you know lord rama krishna etc etc uh, this afrasia is one of the legendary kings in iranian history and mahmud of ghazni started to glorify the iranian culture that he himself starts to started to claim that uh he is a descendant of this legendary king okay so the thus the turks became not only islamized but also persianized clear okay? so the turkish people who were initially not even muslims they actually converted to islam so they became islamized and now they also became persianized so in india mahmud's memory is only that of a plunderer and a destroyer of temples okay although i mean mahmud waged plenty of battles in central asia he managed to expand his empire there he you know uh, 
was able to give some kind of stability to his kingdom. Okay, so he was actually a pretty good king as far as Central Asian politics is concerned. But when he came to India, his association with India is nothing more than that of a plunderer and a destroyer of temples. This is true. Why? Because again, the basic Turkish habit prevailed. He came to India, he plundered and looted plenty of areas, massacred many people, destroyed various temples, idols, etc. etc. And rather than trying to bring peace to that region, he immediately retreated back with the amassed wealth. So his association with India was nothing more than that of a plunderer and a destroyer of temples. He conducted 17 raids into India. Mahmud of Ghazni conducted 17 raids to India. Initial raids, okay, uh, out of these raids, the initial raids were basically focused against the Hindu Shahi rulers who were ruling the northwestern part of India, that is Peshawar and you know, Punjab, that region. Okay, if you have to come to India, you have to do that either through sea or through land. And these people, uh, Muhammad of Ghazni came, arrived in India through the land route. Okay, so he had to cross the northwest uh, hills and all. Uh, the Hindu Shahi rulers were in power at that time uh, in those regions. And Ghazni's initial raids were against these rulers. Okay, and the Hindu Shahi capital at that time was at Udbanda or Vaihind, that is Peshwa. Okay, so in about 19, 9, uh, 990, 991, under Sabuk Tijin, okay, Sabuk Tijin, a very famous general, the Shahis suffered a serious defeat. Okay, finally, after repeated attempts, uh, repeated skirmishes, uh, under Sabuk Tijin, the you know, uh, uh, Ghazni's army managed to impose huge defeats to the Shahi rulers. And following this, the provinces of Kabul and Jalalabad were annexed to Ghazni. Kabul is very, very important territory. We will see, study about Kabul later also. We will see that the northwestern India is defended by a very an imaginary strategic line called as Kabul Ghazni Kandahar line. Okay, I think some of you would know this. Otherwise, you can remember Kabul Ghazni Kandahar line. It comes later on in history. Uh, it is actually established by Akbar. Okay, Akbar establishes the northwestern border of India and he defends it pretty well also. It is one of the biggest contributions of Akbar to Indian history, the Kabul Ghazni Kandahar line. So here also we will we see that Kabul and along with Jalalabad at this point of time are very two strategic bastions at the uh, in history. And loss of these two will have serious consequences in medieval Indian history and the uh, kingdoms who were ruling North India at that time. So the Shahi ruler Jayapala had in the meantime strengthened his position, okay, uh, bringing Lahore under his control. So sh the Shahis were not ready to give up or anything. They also had pretty good rulers. One of the most important ones is Jayapala and he managed to conquer or annex Lahore and he was holding on to uh, his territories. So the Shahi power extended over Punjab you know, uh, and Peshawar and you know they were basically controlling that area. So now we see that Ghazni's territory and this territory, the Shahi territory, both have a common boundary. Both are very close to each other. So now wars cannot be avoided. Obviously there will be plenty of wars regarding territory and all neighboring areas. So it's very much uh, you know inevitable. Yeah, considering their, you know, considering the kind of polity those times had, uh, these kinds of skirmishes and wars were almost inevitable. Okay, it's not like there is no established line or anything. In modern days, we have nations who have fixed boundaries and all. We have international organizations which, you know, which can ensure that these boundaries are not violated. We have the idea of sovereignty, etc., etc. But in those times, it's not like that. Every ruler want to expand the first opportunity that they got. Okay, so this was the condition. So in a furious battle near Peshawar, Jayapala was defeated. Okay, this, despite a pretty good ruler, Jayapala was defeated in one of the battles uh, near Peshawar. And Mahmud advanced to the Shahi capital and he ravaged it and he plundered it. Okay, and peace was made by ceding the territory west, to, west of Indus to Mahmud. So Shahi rulers lost the battle. They, uh, Jayapala had to cede all the territories west of the river Indus to Mahmud, and you know, as a uh, treaty that was signed after this war. But soon after this happened, Jayapala died, and his son Anandapala came into power. 
he was a pretty good ruler and he conducted you know various battles you know small small battles and he won some of them or he lost some of them but in a decisive battle that happened near indus in 1009 anandapala also was defeated and mahamud devastated his new capital nandana in the salt ranges and overran his fort called nagarkot nagarkot was the fort of uh, anandapala and in a battle in, in 1009 Anandapala was thoroughly defeated and Mahmud you know managed to annex all these regions into his kingdom so peshawar all gone to the uh, mahmud's territory okay so now earlier uh, uh, during the time of jayapala their territories extended up to the western bank of indus but now after anandapala's defeat the territory of the gasnavid empire extended up to the river chelam so they are basically in india now okay so now what did they do mahmud tried to annex kashmir okay kashmir another very uh, prominent empire and he wanted to annex kashmir i mean jalam the, he is already at jalam so kashmir is the next territory so he tried to annex Ka- kashmir but did not happen why because the weather conditions were not in his favor i mean kashmir is a very rough terrain the climate is also very harsh uh, especially in winter and all and mahmud of ghazni couldn't uh, you know managed to get a win there especially due to the poor weather conditions so the struggle against shahis was a prolonged one and the shahis basically put a very strong resistance but eventually they were beaten okay so in india also we have certain kinds of you know such powers who were started to come up you know springing up here and there smaller smaller rulers initially and consolidating their empires as time went on most important of them were the rajputs we saw the emergence of rajputs in the previous class and rajputs were starting to show their metal around this time okay but the thing is while this hindu shahi rulers were facing defeat against a foreign power none of the rajputs came for their help i mean in modern day india we all stand together as indians but during those times there was no idea of nationalism okay so basically for rajputs everything outside their territory were foreign okay so even hindu shahi rulers were not exactly like uh, you know uh, they did not have that common feeling of nationalism or you know being a part of india or anything because india basically did not exist at that time the you know idea of india comes very late okay so none of the rajputs went for the uh, went to help the hindu shahi rulers at this time so it made the victory of mahmud much more easier than what what it would have been okay and mahmud's victory were actually was actually exaggerated uh, uh, by the historians a lot especially we uh, study more about mahmud from the records left behind by this this 17th century historian named as ferishta and ferishta basically exaggerated a lot okay i mean he was in all praising mahmud and uh, he, i mean exaggerated the numbers etc etc according to his records the rajputs you know went for helping in the hindu shahi ruler but despite the help of rajputs still they lost against mahmud because mahmud was such a great king and you know so and so lots of exaggerations were there in uh, ferishta's record so we cannot rely on it 100% by 10 not 1015 okay mahmud was now ready to attack the indo gangetic valley so from the samanid you know uh, decline of samanid empire after forming gasni he started to come you know towards india slowly he studied how he you know entered first of all he conquered kandahar and jalalabad then he managed to annex peshawar and all came up to river jhelum and then crossed it and tried to annex kashmir lost uh, so he none of the rajput rulers went for helping hindu shahi rulers so now he has almost you know is you know in the verge of annexing the entire north india and the most prominent region in the north india is indo gangetic valley okay if you remember the tripartite struggle basically happened for the control of this area kanauj kanauj is very important because it is in the indo gangetic valley okay so now the mahmud was ready to annex this region indo gangetic valley so he the basic aim was again plundering the rich temples and towns and you know amassing wealth etc etc so that activities of mahmud continued he conducted multiple raids in india but while he was doing all these raids he also made sure to 
conduct battles in Central Asia that was good for his own consolidation, his own empire's consolidation. Okay, I mean basically he was a Central Asian ruler, he is from Gusni. So he has to protect and expand his empire there. Okay, he might be fighting wars here and plundering all this wealth. He was not using it for his personal needs alone. He might be using it for it, but while he did all these things, he took all this wealth and used it back in his home to conduct wars against his enemies there and consolidate the Khasni power. Okay, and that he did pretty well. He was considered as one of the best rulers at that time of the Central Asian politics. Mahmud, I mean, he, along with his plundering habit, he also had this habit of destroying temples and you know idols within the temples. And for this, he is known as a Shikhan or the destroyer of images. Okay, and you know, for the glory of Islam, Islamic uh, Islam does not believe in this idolatry. Uh, idolatry is basically a part of Hindu religion. Islam does not have it. And Mahmud used to I already, as I have mentioned, he destroyed plenty of temples. He destroyed plenty of idols and all. And for this purpose, he is known as the destroyer of images. Some of the most daring attempts made by Mahmud include those against Kannauj, against the Somnath temple of Gujarat in 1025. That is the most famous one, so the plunder of Somnath temple. Okay. Similarly, uh, his plundering of Mathura, Kannauj, etc., etc. So basically, there was no strong stage in North India at that time. Okay. So what? So what I'm trying to say is nobody tried to stop Mahmud in an efficient manner. I mean, plenty of adults were there, but nobody was strong enough to create a real threat to Mahmud. Hindu Shahi rulers tried. If the Rajputs had helped them, maybe things would have been different. But India was in an utter state of confusion. Okay. And all these kings fighting for themselves that there was no combined army or there was nobody to put up a stiff resistance, which was actually good enough to prevent this incursion by Gasnavids. Okay, so this was the condition. Yeah, Shahi rulers, Hindu Shahi rulers, all, all the same. Okay. Prabha, welcome. Uh, Seema, welcome. Good evening. So, continuing. So, basically, uh, in 1025, uh, he made the plan for raiding Somnath temple, which was fabulously rich at that time. And uh, while the commander of the city, the Somnath, uh, in which Somnath temple was located. When he heard that Mahmud of Ghazni is actually going to attack that city, he fled. I mean, he knew that there is no point in fighting. He, definitely, they would end up losing. So, the commander immediately fled upon hearing his approach. Uh, but the citizens fought a very strong battle. Okay, the citizens of that town, they were very much attached to this temple. Okay, I mean, I already told you in the previous classes, temples were not just religious places at that time. It was associated with economy, trade, education, everything. Okay, basically, temples were the focus of uh, you know all towns around those times. Okay, so the people in that area they put up a stiff resistance against Muhammad of Ghazni. But I think you know what would have happened. I mean, what what is about to happen? Uh, Muhammad of Ghazni, uh, you know, made an easy victory. People were massacred, slaughtered. Uh, he destroyed the Somnath temple, he broke the Shivalinga, Shivaling, uh, was a Shiv, Shaiva temple and he broke the Shivalinga and he took a piece along with him back to Ghazni as a trophy. Okay, so he returned to Ghazni loaded with immense wealth. Okay, there are sayings that he was able to, you know, cancel all the taxes in Ghazni for about three years. That was the kind of wealth. Okay, I mean, not three years exactly, uh, that comes with later regarding Nadir Shah and all. But uh, the, the, uh, well, Ghazni amassed a very huge amount of wealth while he went back to uh, his kingdom. Okay, but and later on he died uh, about five years later after the Somnath plunder, he died in 1030. So the Ghaznavid conquest of Punjab and Multan completely changed the political situation of North India. Okay, I mean, he did all these things. He may have went back, etc. He did not, you know, manage to make an Indian empire of the Ghaznavid dynasty. But still, his incursions and his battles in India created significant differences, significant changes in the North Indian politics. Okay? So following the death of Mahmud, another powerful empire came into being. That is known as the Seljuk Empire. 
Okay, the Ghaznavid Empire uh, is ended at, by the death of Mahmud and the Seljuk Empire came into power. This empire included modern countries of Syria, Iran, Transoxiana, etc. etc. And they contended with the Ghaznavids for the control of Khurasan. Khurasan, very important area in the Central Asian politics, just like Kanauj for India. Khurasan was the bone of contention in the Central a between the Central Asian empires. And Seljuk dynasty contested for Khurasan against Ghaznavids. And in a very famous battle, Masood, the son of Mahmud, was completely defeated and he had to flee to Lahore for refuge. Okay, he, the Mahmud's son, the current ruler of Ghaznavid dynasty, uh, Ghaznavid empire, was defeated and he had no choice but to flee towards Lahore and escape himself. So now the Ghaznavid empire, which was very powerful during the time of Mahmud of Ghazni, shrank into the area uh, of Ghazni. Okay, it was a very vast empire, but due to this repeated defeats, it shrank into a smaller territory around Ghazni and Punjab. Okay, so now we can see why the Ghaznavids had no choice but come to India. Central, Central Asia, Seljuk dynasty was taking power, taking over control. They could not resist against them, so they had to fall back. So they fell back towards northwestern India. Okay, so these reasons are these are also the reasons why they had no choice but to attack India or but to enter Indian territory. Okay, so around this time, a number of new states rose in North India, which could counter Ghaznavid threats. Okay, so while this Central Asian politics was going on, India was also changing. In India, also new states were coming up, falling down, etc. etc. But as time went on, by this time, uh, some very strong states started to emerge in India who could effectively put up resistance against Ghaznavids, especially the Rajputs. Okay, I already told you Rajputs were there for a long time now. Initially, they were very, you know, uh, small, small clans and all. But now they have started to establish themselves and started to become as a uh, contending power. So there are plenty of controversies regarding the origin of these Rajputs. I think we have already covered that in previous class. Okay, so basically the breakup of Pratihara Empire met with the rise of a number of Rajput states. Although initially there was a period of confusion, uh, some of these Rajput states managed to establish themselves and things were becoming more and more clear in North Indian politics. Okay, and the most important of these were the Gahadawalas of Kanauj, Paramaras of Malwa and Chauhans of Ajmer. These three were the most prominent Rajputs. Rajput states that came up. Gahadawalas of Kanauj, Paramaras of Malwa and Chauhans of Ashmir. You have to remember this. This could be asked as, as the following. Okay. This dynasty, the area where they ruled. Very important. Okay. So uh, along with these prominent ones, so the certain small ones also came into being. Some of the uh, well-known ones among them are the Kalachuris which uh, ruled over the modern Jabalpur area, Chandelas, who ruled over Bundelkhand, the Chalukyas of Gujarat, Tomars of Delhi. Okay, these were also some of the prominent dynasties uh, which came up around those times. I think you are very familiar with the Chandela dynasty because they are associated with the construction of Kajrao temple. Okay, so these, you know, Rajput clans and dynasties, you know, uh, came up during this time. So, Gahadwalas of Kanauj were among one of the most powerful among them. Among them. Okay, they were, maybe we can say that they were the most powerful uh, among the Rajput clans. And they managed to squeeze out the Palas and they occupied Bihar. Okay, Palas earlier had Orissa, Bihar and Bangar. And now, the Gahadwalas were strong enough that they managed to uh, squeeze out the Palas from Bihar and take control over Bihar. And the greatest ruler of this dynasty is Govind Chandra, greatest ruler of Gahadawalas is Govind Chandra. But we are not familiar with this name, but we are familiar with his son, that is Jaya Chandra, the son of Govind Chandra. Okay, I think at least some of you would remember what were the contributions of Jaya Chandra during the battle of terrain, okay, essentially zero. Okay, but we know him as a kind of a traitor. Okay, uh, we'll study that in a bit. But Jay Chandra is somebody who is very well known for us. So he was the son of the greatest of Gahadawalas that is Govinda Chandra. 
So Jayachandra had always this contention uh, with Chauhans. Okay, basically the uh, Chauhans and Gahadavalas were some two of the prominent powers along with Paramaras. But Paramara, the Malwa region is comparatively down. So basically Chauhans of Ajmer and Gahadavalas of Kanaush never met eye to eye. Jayachandra and Chauhans were always such loggerheads. Okay, this is one of the reasons why Jayachandra will not help the Chauhans during the Battle of Terrain. And eventually Prithviraj III end up losing the second Battle of Terrain. Okay, but anyway, the Chauhans who had served under the rulers of Gujarat established them their capital at Nadol towards the end of 10th century. Okay, Bas uh, this is how the Chauhans emerged. They were initially, uh, you know, they served under the rulers of Gujarat. Okay, but later on they managed to establish their own kingdom with capital at a place called Nador towards the end of 10th century. And greatest of this dynasty is perhaps Vigraharaj. This ruler captured Chittor and established Ajmer and made it its capital. Okay, Ajay Meru is the older name and now it's known as Ajmer. Clear, Ajmer became the capital of Chauhans and this city was actually established by Vigraharaj who is the greatest of Chauhans. He also built Sanskrit college at Ashmer and the Anasagar lake uh, in this region. Again a question for planes. The Anasagar lake was actually built by Vigraharaj, one of the greatest Chauhans. Okay, so he came into conflict with the Paramaras of Malwa. And among the Paramaras of Malwa, the most important king is Bhoja. Okay, I think now you have a very basic idea of you know, which old dynasty were there and who were the important kings and you know, uh, how North Indian politics was during that time. So look at this map so that you can have a better understanding and visualization. So we have the Gahadavalas here, we have the Chauhans here. So there is obvious, I mean it's very obvious that they two were constantly fighting each other because they shared a common boundary. Then we have Chandelas here, we have the Chalukyas here. Okay, so this was the setup during those times. We can see Ghasni here, Multan, all important, Lahore, okay, Ajmer or Ajayameru. Okay, this map is there in your NCRT, you can check it out later. So the most famous among the Chauhan rulers uh, is actually Prithviraj III. The greatest was Vigraharaj, but the most popular one is Prithviraj III because obviously he is the one who fought in the battle of terrain and we studied about that battle uh, during our history classes in school. Okay, so he ascended the throne at a very young age, uh, around 11 years of old and later on he became a very, uh, you know, he took control over the empire himself when he came of age. Okay, so he embarked a very vigorous policy of expansion, you know, just like any other ruler at that time. But he was not so successful in his struggle against the Chauhan rulers of Gujarat. Okay, look again, look at this map. Chauhans are here. We have the Chalukyas, the rulers of Gujarat are here. Uh, so they contested many battles, but Chauhans were not, Prithras III was not, uh, you know, making any strides towards the Chau Chalukyas of Gujarat. I mean, none of them were successful. So he led an expedition in Bundelkhand against its capital, Mahoba. Okay, since Gujarat was no progress, uh, Prithiraj III led, uh, focused his uh, ambition towards Bundelkhand. Okay, and it is actually during this skirmishes, these wars, that two of his very famous warriors, Allah and Udal, lost his life, lost their lives. So Allah and Udal are the, uh, you know, um, two famous warriors of Prithiraj III, and they lost their life in the battle of Bundelkhand, in, uh, which took place at uh, Mahoba, its capital. So, <coughs> the Chandela ruler of Mahoba is said to have been supported in this struggle by Jayachandra of Kanauj. So again, whenever Prithiraj III or whenever the Chauhans try to expand their empire, their main contender, the uh, Ghadavalas, who is ruled by Jayachandra at that time, creates trouble. Okay, Jaitendra supports the opponent and this is the reason why we see that Chauhans and Gahadavalas never go hand in hand. They always create trouble for each other. And when the enemy arrives in the picture, one of them betrays the other. 
okay so all all of them are still rush books okay basically we call all of these people together as rush books although they are you know fighting with each other uh, at this time so the basis of this rajput dynasty or this rajput society was clan okay the basic unit of this rajput society was a clan and every clan traced its lineage back to some common ancestor you know real or imaginary okay, for example yesterday we studied that some of the rajputs they you know they claim that they are descendants of the lunar race or the solar race from the mythological stories and all okay so this kind of descend you know tracking their lineages or say claiming some lineages were very common among rajputs and uh, they had this you know basic unit as clan so some of the, some of their chief characteristics or features were attachment to land family and honor okay attachment to land family and honor this was very important for them rajputs were very brave fighters okay i mean they they would give up their life to protect these three things land family and honor you have heard of johar and all right johar and all are performed by rajput women to protect their dignity and their pride okay so these three things land family and honor were very important for rajputs though their fiefs were supposed to be held at the pleasure of the ruler the rajput notion of sanctity of land did not permit their resumption of resumption by the ruler so Uh, in the rajput society also this idea of you know feudalism or the fief existed so the ruler assigns a part of his territory to a particular chief that is basically the fief okay and this is you you know theoretically this is transferable this can be transferred to another chief uh, any time okay this is basically held during the pleasure of the ruler but due to this this feature this attachment to land which is very core to the rajput Uh, uh character in all for all practical purposes the transfer of land never happened unless in extreme cases of open rebellion or mutiny okay unless that chief entered into open rebellion against the ruler or something like that of extreme character the transfer of ha- uh, land never really took place so naturally or eventually this fiefs started to become hereditary okay it's passed from father to son and it stood with that family or that clan for a very long time and they had this sense of brotherhood and egalitarianism between the rajputs okay rajputs had this bond of brotherhood and this you know idea of egalitarianism between them but although this is a positive thing this is also one of their biggest drawbacks okay because it was very difficult to maintain discipline among them amongst themselves Okay, they had this idea of brotherhood and all, but they constantly fought with each other, and this there was no, you know, uh, it was difficult to maintain discipline uh, among their clans. They basically treated these wars as kind of sport. Okay, uh, they you know, according to them, an ideal ruler would is one who led to, you know, one who led this country to war immediately after the Dasara festival. Okay, that was the kind of society. Uh, prevalent at that time so an ideal rajput ruler was the one who led out his armies after celebrating dasara festival so basically these uh, conducting wars and battles were a sport for the rajputs most of the rajput rulers at that time cham were champions of hinduism okay they were hindu rulers i think all of you know know it but there were some who patronized jainism as well okay we are talking about the region around As- uh, rajasthan Okay, so you know we have the Mount Dilwara Temple, Mount Abu Temple, etc., etc. In that, uh, you know, Western and Northwestern India, so you can associate Jainism is also very prevalent uh, there. So Hinduism and Jainism were patronized by Rajputs. They gave rich donations to you know temples, brahmanas, etc., etc. Okay, so the system of giving you know a low rate of land revenue to brahmanas continued during the time of Rajputs as well. and in return brahmanas used to legalize or you know give the mandate to these rajput kings to rule okay i mean brahmana the brahmana will endorse that these rajputs are the descendants of lunar and solar families and all okay so this was the kind of arrangement between rajputs the kshatriyas and brahmans uh, brahmanas okay so this kind of arrangement continued during their time so between the 10th and 12th centuries 
the climax in temple building happened in North India. So plenty of temples were constructed in North India. South India also. We see the construction of uh, Raja Raja temple uh, in 1010 and all. We studied about that yesterday. So this was the time in medieval India where we see a climax in temple building all over India. But in North India, unlike the Dravidian style which was prevalent in South India, a particular kind of style emerged named as Nagara. Okay, I will take this in detail during our art and culture sessions. But just for now, uh, understand this. The main feature of the Nagara temple is called, uh, is basically a Shikhara. Okay, it's not written here. It is called a Shikhara. It is basically a tall curved spiral roof over the Garpagriha or the deity room. Okay, yesterday, I think I showed you that. If this is the deity room, that means the main idol is kept within this room. On top of that, you see something known as a Shikhara. This is very common in North Indian temples, in the Nagara style of architecture. Clear? This is known as a Shikhara. There are different types of Shikharas and all, etc. Uh, you know, et et we will study that later. But anyway, the main room was generally a square. And there used to be a Mandava added to the Sanctum Sanctorum. In certain cases, there we see the uh, outer walls as well. Okay? Usually, in Nagara style of architecture, we do not come across compound walls. But there are exceptions in certain temples where we actually see a compound wall. Okay, so the Khajuraho temple in Madhya Pradesh and the Bhubaneswar in Orissa are very famous areas or examples of this style of architecture. Parshwanatha temple, Vishwanatha temple and Kandariya Mahadeva temple at Khajuraho illustrates this style. All these temples are very famous, world famous temples built by Chandelas. Okay, Vishwanatha temple, Kandariya Mahadeva temple, Parshwanatha temple, all these are part of the Khajuraho temple complex built by Chandelas. Similarly, in uh, Orissa, the Ling Lingaraja temple, similarly the Sun temple at Konark, Jagannath temple at Puri, all belongs to this period. This is why earlier I told you, this century, okay, or this couple of centuries, witnessed the climax of temple building in North India. All these prominent temples, uh, which are even very prevalent today, were built during this period of time. Okay. Any questions? Northwestern region had always been important for Indian territory since ancient time. As we saw invasion from Indo-Greek, Saka, but why in later period no kingdom paid attention to Northwestern region? See, a uh, very good observation, Satya. It is obviously true because that is the only way in which India can be attacked through land. Okay, I mean, nobody can attack India through land from its northeastern boundary. Why? Because for one, uh, if you try to attack via Myanmar, it is dense forest. Okay, and if you, uh, if you try to attack from the northeastern uh, border of India, it is Himalayas and Himalayas protects India from everything, every such ambitions. Okay, so northwestern border is the only land border through which India can be attacked. And this was prominently used by, you know, ancient and medieval kings and traders, uh, travelers, etc, etc. But most of the rulers in India often abandoned this. But understand that it is not the prominent rulers who abandon it. Okay, prominent rulers like, uh, say, Akbar or Shah Jahan, they paid attention to northwest borders. Because they created an empire and they knew how to administer it. They consolidated it and they prevented, uh, you know, foreign incursions and all to a huge extent and managed to maintain peace within the established empire. But the moment such empires or emperors are replaced by weak ones, immediately due to this feudal character of Indian society at that time or feudal character of Indian polity at that time, the regional governors becomes independent or start, you know, starts claiming independence and starts to become autonomous. Okay, so when that happens, these huge empires collapse into very small petty states, none of which is capable of defending against a strong attack from anywhere else. And when these huge empires fall down into small, small petty states, each of these states starts to, you know, or attempts to take the seat of the old empire. Okay, the newly formed small, small states, each of them, every one single one of them will try to claim the seat of the old emperor. 
So basically, they will be embroiled in a war within themselves rather than paying attention to real enemies who are advancing towards India. There are other reasons also that we will study very soon. I hope you got a very basic idea. Okay. So temp continuing, temples in North India, uh, they were just like South Indian temples. They were centers of social and cultural life. Some of them, such as the you know Temple of Somnath, etc., became very wealthy and all, and attracted foreigners for say maybe for pilgrimage purpose as well as for you know plundering activities as conducted by Muhammad of Ghazni. So along with temples, these Rajput rulers also built plenty of palaces, forts, you know uh, public works, uh, you know uh, for you know public utility uh, works, etc., etc. Tap wells like Bowlies, Boons, etc. Okay, this time, this period in history also witnessed a lot of progress in art, culture, literature, and etc. etc. So, plenty of books and plays were written in Sanskrit uh, during this period. Okay, Rajputs were, I already told you, basically they were Hindu uh, patterns of Hinduism. So, Sanskrit was very, very crucial, uh, and San a very a many number of plays and books were written in Sanskrit at that time. Vastupala, the very famous minister of the Chalukyan ruler Bhima in Gujarat, was a writer and patron of scholars and the builder of the beautiful Jain temple at Mount Abu. We have heard about the Mount, Jain temple at Mount Abu. This was built by Vastupala. I told you, Hinduism was the prominent one, but Jainism was also patronized by plenty of rulers. So, Vastupala was not the ruler, he was a minister. Okay, he was a minister to the ruler of Gujarat named Bhima. And he is the person, Vastupala is the person who built the Jain temple at Mount Abu. Similarly, Ujjain and Dhara, the capitals of Paramara rulers, uh, were famous centers of Sanskrit learning. Many works were also written in other common languages, that is Abhabramsa and Prakrit. Prakrit is the language of common people at that time. Sanskrit was the language of elite. Uh, and Abhabramsa, which is a corrupt form of Sanskrit, it was also very prevalent. And literary works were, you know, uh, written in all these languages. So the Jain scholars made significant contributions in this direction, okay, in, especially in Prakrit and Abhabramsa languages. And the most famous among them being the being Hemachandra, who wrote both in Sanskrit and Abhabramsa. Okay, Hemachandra wrote both in Sanskrit and in Abhabramsa. Uh, you know, he was a very, you know, important person as far as Jainist literature is concerned. With the revival of Brahmanism, Sanskrit supplanted Abhabramsa and Prakrit among the upper classes. So basically, Sanskrit, Abhabramsa and Prakrit, these three languages, you know, uh, showed excellence during this time due to the revival of, uh, you know, Hinduism and patronization of Jainism. So this was the condition of India. Rajput rulers were uh, emerging. They had established their territory uh, and, you know, um, the important ones, you know, made many temples, etc, etc. This new style of architecture emerged. Okay, so you have an idea now. Earlier, if you remember, we have stopped the story of Turkish invasion, you know, uh, around the Ganga Valley. Okay, it was Mahmud of Ghazni's idea to, incur, uh, to attack the Ganga Valley and he was getting ready to conduct all that. And in India, this is the condition. So now we see how the Turks invaded India and conquered North India. Okay, so there are only a very uh, few number of slides left and I will end today's session by the end of this chapter. Uh, tomorrow we will start with the Delhi Sultanate. Okay, so after the Ghasna with conquest of Punjab, two distinct patterns of relations emerged between Muslims and Hindus. Okay, remember, I, I hope you remember all this. Ghasna with Empire, uh, you know, they attacked, they came to India, defeated Kandahar, uh, annexed Kandahar annexed Peshawar, tried to conquer Jammu Kashmir, okay. But anyway, Ghasnavith uh, Empire managed to con conquer Punjab. And once they did that, now they are within the Indian territory, at least the modern Indian territory. So this, you know, proximity or this in intermingling of the Ghasnaviths and the Indians and the native Indians led to the emergence of two kinds of relationships. One is that of loot and plunder. Okay, one, this is one kind of relationship. Ghasnavids occasionally conduct raids into the Indian territory. They loot, they plunder, they massacre, they take the wealth back. This is the first kind of relationship. Second one, 
Now, Muslim traders were allowed or even welcomed in the country since they helped in strengthening and augmenting India's trade with Western Central Asian countries and increasing the income of India. This was the positive relationship. Okay, the traders, the travelers, etc., who came from this Ghaznavid Empire or from other countries, they were welcomed by Indian rulers. Why? Because these people helped to establish good kind of trade and commerce between various nations which are beneficial for India's economy or their own uh, kingdom's economy. This was the positive relationship. The other one is negative relationship. Okay, so these kinds of relationships emerged during this time. And in the wake of these, a number of Muslim religious preachers called as Sufis came into Punjab. Okay, Sufism is not, not indigenous to India. It was born in Central Asia. But due to this arrival of you know, uh, Islamized Turks into the Indian region, Sufis also came to India. And a process of interaction between Islam and Hindu religion and the society was started. Okay, once Sufis came to India, they started absorbing certain practices from indigenous people and you know, it evolved in its own way. Hindu generals such as Tilak, who is actually a barber by caste, commanded the Ghasnavid armies. Similarly, there were Hindu jar soldiers were you know, recruited into their army. So, religion was not a barrier. Okay, religious interaction was very much liberal. There was, it was not like, uh, you know, Muslims versus Hindus. Okay, again, I am men mentioning it repeatedly. We do not see any kind of communalism during these times. During these times, it is basically plundering, looting for political superiority or, you know, for wealth, etc, etc. There is nothing between, you know, none of these are conducted based on religious hatredness or uh, communalism. Okay. Any questions? Shashank, yeah, ask the question, please. Yes, Satya, correct. Nagara style of temple building can be associated with Rajputs. It emerged during this period. Okay, plenty of other kingdoms also contributed to it, but definitely Rajputs. I mean, almost all the main temples that we said earlier, uh, you know, built by, were built by Chandelas, uh, you know, and other, Rajput, and other Rajput clans. Okay, so definitely, yes. Whether the gunpowder were in use in India before the entrance of Babar? Uh, yeah, actually it was, I mean, it, India Indians knew about it, but they never used it in, a, in their artilleries at that time. Okay, using that in an, uh, along with the artillery, that kind of battle tactic was actually introduced by Babar. But that does not mean Indians did not know about it. Indians knew about it and, and it was used but not in the sense Babar used. Okay? Continuing. So, two new powers came into uh, prominence in Central Asia at this time. That is the Khwarizmi Empire, which is based on Iran, and the Khurid Empire based on Khur or the Northwestern Afghanistan. Okay? Khur region means Northwestern Afghanistan. So, these two are the prominent kingdoms that rose. Khwarizmi Empire and Khurid Empire. Khwarizmi in Iran, Khurid in Afghanistan. So again, they two are neighbors. Obviously, they will be fighting each other. Okay, needless to mention. The Khurids started as the vassals of Ghazni, but they soon, you know, established themselves and the power of Ghurids increased under the Sultan Alauddin, who earned the title Jahan Sos. Prelims question. Which of the following rulers are known, uh, is known as Jahan Sos? Okay, answer is Sultan Alauddin, he is actually a Ghurid emperor. So again, Khurasan was the main bone of contention. Khurasan, I told you, just like Kanauj, it is very much important for Central Asian dynamics. So Khurasan was the bone of contention between the Ghurid and the uh, Khwarizmi empire and they began to fight for it. And this was finally conquered by Harisam Shah. Okay, and this left no option for the Khurids but to look for expansion towards India. So, Khwarizmi Empire managed to capture Khurasan. Okay, Khwarizm Shah is the person of the uh, from Khwarizmi Empire who managed to capture Khurasan. So now, the Khurid Empire has lost their main, uh, you know, goal in Central Asia. So they did not had a choice but look towards India because India at this time we do not have you know, a very major empire. There are prominent Rajput families there, but none of them is like 
a huge empire in the sense of uh, Mughals or Delhi Sultanate or anything. Okay, so in 1173, Shahabuddin Muhammad, also known as Muizuddin Muhammad bin Sam, okay, he ascended the throne in Ghazni while his elder brother was ruling Ghur. In 1170, these all are stories, just uh, you know, hear it and you know, move on. In 1178, he attempted to penetrate into Gujarat by marching across Rajabutana desert. Okay, but the Gujarat ruler completely routed uh, him in a battle near Mount Abu. So his ambitions uh, in uh, during this time did not succeed. Why? Because the Gujarat rulers, the uh, Chalukyas, okay, they uh, were strong enough to wade off uh, Muizuddin Muhammad bin Sam. But in 1190, Muizuddin Muhammad had conquered Peshawar, Lahore, and Sialkot and was poised to thrust towards Delhi and Ganjitigdo. Okay, I think you would have heard about Muizuddin, uh, this person, Muizuddin Muhammad bin Sam, uh, under a different name. Okay, any ideas? I, all of you know it, we will soon come to it. Okay, Muizuddin Muhammad bin Sam, also known as Shahabuddin Muhammad, uh, in, in, by 1190, he, after repeated attempts, he managed to conquer Peshawar, Lahore, Sialkot, etc., etc., and he was ready to conquer Delhi and Gangetic too. So, in India at that time, Chauhan's power, uh, Chauhan power was growing steadily. They had defeated and killed large number of Turks in earlier in battles in Rajasthan and all. Okay, and they captured Delhi from uh, Tomars. So basically, Chauhans were ruling the major chunk of northern India. So the expansion of the Chauhan power towards Punjab, okay, and the expansion of this Ghurid power towards Gangetic Dobe came together in a common boundary. So basically, Punjab was already under Gurit power. So they were trying to expand towards Gangetic though. And Chauhans who already conquered Delhi was trying to expand towards Punjab. So now they have a common border. Which means what? They are about to have a battle between each other. The Gurits versus Chauhans. Okay. And this battle happened in a very famous battleground known as Terrain and is known as the Battle of Terrain. Two battles happened. The first one happened in 1191. The idea was, the, I mean, the main goal of this was uh, rival claims for Tabarhinda. Tabar uh, both of them were laying claims for this territory, Tabarhinda. And uh, it is for this purpose, the war was fought. Okay, but eventually we will see that there is much more to this war than acquiring a small territory. Okay, this war sets a historic landmark in India's uh, medieval, medieval history. Okay, it completely changes Indian politics. We will see a watershed movement after the Battle of Terrain. In the Battle of Terrain. Okay, so Muizuddin Muhammad, also known as Muhammad of Khori or Muhammad of Khor, he met Prithiraj III in the Battle of Terrain. In the first battle, the Khurid forces were completely routed and Prithiraj uh, pushed towards Darbhinda and conquered it. Darbhinda and conquered it. But in the second battle of terrain that happened the very next year, the fate turned completely. Okay, so Prithiraj lost and Muhammad of Khor won. But don't think that Prithiraj lost because he was you know, negligent of state affairs or anything. Uh, he was careful about all these things. But still, Prithiraj lost because of a variety of reasons. So it is true that at this time, Skanda, the main general of the previous battle, he was engaged somewhere else. Okay. Skanda was the main general of Prithiraj Chauhan who acquired this victory in the first battle of terrain. And Skanda was doing, I mean, he was deployed somewhere else at this time uh, when the second battle happened. So this is one of the reasons why uh, battle of Ter second battle of terrain did not go in favor of Prithiraj Chauhan. Okay, similarly, we have to understand that as soon as Prithiraj realized the nature of the Khurit threat, he appealed to all the Rajas of Northern India for help. Okay, when, when immediately when he saw that the second battle of terrain is about to happen, when you know, Muhammad of Khori is advancing, he tried to form an alliance with other uh, rulers and Rajas of Northern India. Okay, and according to history, uh, we are told that plenty of Rajas actually came for his help. Okay, Prithiraj Chauhan managed to assemble a huge army uh, to, to resist the uh, raid of Khurids. Problem was, one of the main 
powers in North India, the Gahadawalas under Jayachandra did not come for help. Jayachandra stood away. Why? I have already given you the correct reason. That is, there is already a contention for Kanaush between these two people. I mean, not for Kanaush, for territory in general. Both Pritra Chauhan and Jayachandra of the Gahadawalas, both of them wanted, both of them were neighboring powers and both of them were contending each other for a very long time. Historical you know, family feud, for, <laughs> we can say it like that. Okay, so their dynamics was not pretty cool. And when the time came, when Pritra Chauhan wanted help, Jayachandra did not give that help. But, uh, I mean, from Chand Bardai, okay, wait, there is a very famous poet uh, named as Chand Bardai. According to him, there is some other reason also, uh, although historians do not believe this story. But anyway, according to Chand Bardai, who wrote Prithiraj Raso, uh, Prithiraj was actually, uh, you know, in love with Jayachandra's daughter, Sanyogita, and he actually abducted Sanyogita uh, from Jayachandra. Okay, and this is the reason why Jayachandra is angry with Prithiraj Chauhan and all. So this is another story that is there in history, but historians do not actually believe this because uh, Chandbardai's stories have many events that may not be true. Okay, so anyway, the numerical strength of Indian sources, uh, Indian forces was probably pretty high. Okay, why? Because although Jayachandra did not come for help, there were plenty of rulers who did help uh, Prithira Chauhan against Muhammad of Kor. Problem is, the Turkish army was much better organized and led. I already told you, the chief gen general Skanda was not there. Okay, for in the side of Prithira Chauhan. He was uh, elsewhere in another battle. Okay, so the leading of the army uh, was not as good as Turks. So the Turks had a superior organized and superiorly led army and the battle was you know, mostly decided based on cavalry. Okay, both sides had a very good number. Indian side maybe have more number compared to Turks, but Turks were well organized and led well. So the deciding factor in this battle was more or less the cavalry. As you already know, the Central Asian horses are much more quicker and much more, you know, superior quality compared to Indian horses. I already gave you, I told you this in yesterday's class. Okay, Arabian horses are way superior in quality. So when it comes to this deciding factor, Turks had the advantage. But anyway, Prithiraj managed to escape, but he was captured near Saraswati or Sirsa. Okay, but we are, uh, from history, we understand that uh, he was allowed to rule, continue to rule for some time. Okay, I mean, although they defeated Prithiraj Shohan, the territory was given back to him as long as he accepted the suzerainty of Muhammad of Kor, and he was allowed to rule for some time uh, in Ashmer. Uh, we know this because there we find certain coins around this from this time uh, of, on which it is inscribed Prithviraja Deva on one side and on the other side the, we have the words Sri Mahamud Sam. Okay, on one side the coin says Prithviraja Deva and on the other side it says Sri Mahamud Sam. So there is, I mean, if historians believe that. Uh, because of these evidences, Prithiraj uh, Chauhan did rule uh, for some more time after the Battle of Terrain, Second Battle of Terrain. But later on, Prithiraj Chauhan was executed uh, on charge of conspiracy. And Prithiraj's son succeeded him. Okay, and Delhi was also restored to Tomaru. I told you earlier, Chauhan's had conquered Delhi and all, and most of the North India. But now, once Chauhan's lost, uh, that Delhi was restored back to the initial rulers, that is the Thomas. Okay, but this policy was reversed soon by the Turks. The rulers of Delhi was ousted immediately, and Delhi was made the base of further Turkish advance into Ganga Valley. Okay, so now we see that Delhi is a very prominent political region in India. Okay, from this time onwards, we see that Delhi is one of the most prominent political regions. All the dynasties that come up in India make their base in Delhi or at least eventually shift their base into Delhi. In modern India also we see that Delhi was a very prominent uh, political area during British rule and eventually Delhi became India's capital. So it is a very important territory from this point on history onwards. Okay, it is the base from where every ruler tried to expand into other areas of India. 
and now we are going to see the Turkish conquest of Ganga Valley and Bihar and Bengal. That is from the point on time where Muhammad of Ghori goes back and uh, Kutabuddin Aibak and Muhammad bin Bhaktiar Khalji does their invasions. Okay, this is a very small, I mean, uh, I think there is only a couple more slides. And after that, we will see, uh, you know, the establishment of Delhi Sultanate. Okay. Mm. Okay. Correct, Satya Muhammad of Kaur. Okay. You do not have to retract your messages. Okay, Shashank, you can leave the messages. It's okay there. Uh, it's fine. It's a genuine question. I answered. So, uh, let it be there. If it's okay with you, that's it. Anyway, continuing. The Turkish conquest of Ganga Valley, Bihar and Bangar. We will finish this in 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, small, small uh, topics. So, between 1192 and 1206, Turkish rule was extended over Ganga Jamuna Do and its neighboring areas. Okay, I mean from Delhi they started to expand in all the adjacent regions. The Gahadawala ruler of Jayachandra had been ruling over this state for some time now. Okay, earlier he did not help Prithiraj when the time came. But now Turkish rulers decided to stay. Okay, until this time in history, you have to understand that, for example, people like Ghasni, Muhammad of Ghasni conducted these plunders and loots and he immediately retreated. But now, contrary to their previous actions, they decided to stay back and make Delhi their base of operations. So now, Jayachandra has enemy at the doors. Okay, so we will soon see there happens a war between Jayachandra and uh, Turkish rulers. So anyway, after the Battle of Terrain, Muizuddin or Muhammad of Ghor returned to Ghazni leaving the affairs of India in the hands of his able general, Kutabuddin Aibak. Okay, Kutabuddin Aibak was basically a slave, but during those times, slaves were one of the most trusted people as far as sultans were concerned. Okay, and so the sultan entrusted the Indian affairs to one of his slaves, Kutabuddin Aibak. In 1194, he came back to India. Okay, Muhammad of Kaur came back to India. Uh, he, there was a con very hotly contested battle between Muhammad of Kaur and Jayachandra and this is known as the Battle of Chandavar. Very important. <coughs> Williams question. Battle of Chandavar happened in 11, 94, 95 that period. Okay. And in this battle, Jayachandra lost. Okay. I mean, historians say that Jayachandra almost won in that battle. But towards the end of this battle, Jayachandra got an arrow and he died and his army was defeated without anybody to lead it. Okay, thus these two battles, the battle of terrain and the battle of Chandavar laid the foundations of Turkish rule in North India. Second battle of terrain and battle of Chandavar. A little later, Kutubadi neighbor conquered Kalinjar, Mahoba, Khajraho, etc. from the Chandela rulers. They, uh, he defeated Bhima III, the ruler of Gujarat, Anilwara and a number of other areas also. So, you know, they started to expand within India and conquer no, more and more territories. Okay, but even then, <clears throat> though a Muslim governor was appointed to rule in the place, he was soon ousted. This shows that the Turks were not yet strong enough to be able to rule over such far-flung areas. So, although they, you know, tried to expand into further territories, they could not, you know, keep it under their power. They, although they managed to install certain Muslim governors there, they were immediately ousted. Okay, so even now, even at this period, that is, we are talking about, you know, 1195, 96, you know, very close to 1200. Even now, there is no, uh, these Turkish people are not strong enough to form such a mighty empire in India. Okay, so just like Aibak, who was expanding in this region, we had another officer by the name Bhaktiar Khalji, Muhammad bin Bhaktiar Khalji. Okay, his uncle had fought in the Battle of Terrain and he has been appointed uh, in, as in, with the charge of certain areas beyond Banaras, okay, Eastern India. Okay, Aibak was looking after the Western Indian affairs and the Delhi region, etc. And Khal Muhammad bin Bhaktiar Khalji has been entrusted with the Eastern Indian affairs. Okay, so he continued his expansionist policies there, expanded into Bihar and all. 
He is the person who actually destroyed and ransacked many Buddhist monasteries of Bihar, including Nalanda, Vikramashila, etc. Okay, there, there was no rulers at that time who could protect uh, you know, Nalanda, Taxila, etc. from these attacks, Turkish attacks. Okay, and it is Muhammad bin Bhaktiyar Kalji who destroyed these famous universities. He continued his march towards Bengal and he you know, marched with an army towards Nadia. Nadia is a very famous pilgrim center as far as Senas are concerned. Okay, Bengal at this time is ruled by Sena dynasty. And uh, when Muhammad bin Bhaktiyar Khaki was ad uh, Khalji was advancing, it was Lakshmana Sena who was ruling Bengal. So, Muhammad bin Bhaktiyar Khalji was very tricky. He did not take a huge army and went into attack straight. What did he do? During this time in medieval India, there were, uh, you know, Turkish tradesmen who focused on horses. Okay, there were plenty of trading people who came from Turkey to sell horses. So, Muhammad bin Bhaktiyar Khalji, he, you know, changed his appearance as a trader and he, along with his some soldiers, everybody who, you know, uh, in the, as traders, uh, as disguised as traders, went into uh, Nadia. Okay, and then once they reached there, they started their skirmishes. Okay, they, they went into that region without any kind of uh, resistance. And once they got in, they started to I mean, uh, they entered into battle. So, Lakshmana Sena thought that the Turkish invaders are there within his territory in full force. Okay, but you have to understand this group of traders, I mean, this disguised group as traders is basically a very small force. The real force was a bit behind. But Lakshmana Sena thought that the real force is already here. So, he had no other choice but to escape. So, rather than fighting with Muhammad bin Bhaktiyar Khalji and trying to oust him, Lakshmana Sena escaped. Okay, he escaped. And by this time, the real force came into Bengal and Muhammad bin Bhaktiyar Khalji conquered the Sena capital of Lucknow without any kind of opposition. Nobody fought him uh, during this time. It was a very, you know, walkover for Muhammad bin Bhaktiyar Khalji. Okay, Lakshmana Sena had no choice but moved to Sonar Gaon, another part of uh, Bengal, I mean South Bengal, and there he continued to rule with his successors and all. Okay, but Muhammad bin Khatiyar Galji was not done. He wanted to expand even more. So after Bengal, you have Assam. So he wanted to attack Assam. Okay, so he took another expedition into the Brahmaputra Valley. This was a blunder. Why? Because Conditions has completely changed. It is one thing to win a battle in a very plain ground. The Gang Indo-Gangetic Valley is plain ground. It is easy to win a battle with an organized army. But the moment you go into the northwestern, in northeastern India, things are very different. It is completely forest, hilly areas. Okay, a very unknown territory for Central Asian tribes. Okay, very famous for guerrilla warfares. So, Muhammad bin Bhaktiyar Khalji's expedition to Assam was a total disaster. The Mark rulers of Assam, what did they do? Okay, the, um, Assam was ruled by Mark people, okay. And what did they do? They allowed Muhammad bin Bhaktiyar Khalji and his army to enter Assam. Okay, I mean, they basically fell back as uh, Turkish invaders came in. They basically allowed them to come into their territory. And once they were too much into their territory, they were, you know, in dense forest. They lacked resources. They were tired. They were exhausted and so the Turkish army decided to fall back, okay, retreat and you know, fight the battle some other day. Problem was when the Turkish army decided to retreat and started to move back, the Mark rulers of Assam attacked them from behind continuously and harassed them continuously. Okay, So on one side you have these Mark armies attacking them, on the other side now they have crossed this, you know, Valley, Brahmaputra Valley. So, a huge river is flowing through the other side. So, basically, the Turkish army was caught in between an enemy and a huge river. Okay, and they met with immense disaster, and only a very few people actually came back alive. And Mohammed, this uh, Mohammed bin Bhaktiyar Khalji was actually murdered by one of his own men due to the uh, you know condition that was going on at that time. Clear? 
Muizuddin and his brother were trying to expand the Ghuri Dimbar in Central Asia. Okay, Muhammad Gore went back, I told you that. So he and his brother was trying to expand his empire there in Central Asian region. This imperialistic ambitions of Ghurids brought them into headlong conflict with the powerful Khwarizmi Empire. Okay, now we see the fight between Khwarizmi and Ghurid empires. But anyway, in 1203, Muizuddin suffered a disastrous defeat in the hands of uh, Khwarizmi ruler. And this defeat of Muizuddin emboldened certain rulers in India to rebel. Okay, when they heard that the great conqueror of India, the uh, Muhammad of Ghor, has been defeated in the hands of the Khwarizmi uh, uh, dynasty, certain rulers in India, they became emboldened by this news. I mean, they also believed that they can overthrow this power. The most important ones among them were the Khokas. Okay, it's a warlike tribe in western Punjab and they decided to rebel against them. But they were strongly, you know, suppressed through very brutal and cruel fashion, massacred uh, and, you know, they were brought down. And this is the last campaign that Muhammad of Khor conducted in India. Okay, this, the Khokas, the warlike tribe in western Punjab, rose and cut off the communications between Lahore and Ghazni. And Muhammad of Gore came to India for the last time to suppress this revolt, the revolt of Khokars. Prelims question. Clear, Khokar rebellion. This is the last time Muhammad of Gore came to India. Anyway, Muhammad of, uh, Muhammad, Muhinuddin Muhammad bin Sam has often been compared to Muhammad of Ghazni. Okay, Muhammad of Gore and Muhammad of Ghazni are confusing figures in history. There are instances where when students actually confuse between these two names. Historians also compare these two to identify the similarities of these Turkish invaders and differences between the two. Plenty of similarities are there, plenty of differences are there. As well as we are concerned, the most important points are that it is actually the Muhammad of Ghazni who, you know, who managed to give the foundation for Muhammad of Khor. It was Ghazni who con whose conquest of Punjab which paid the way for Muizuddin's success in Northern India. That is true. That is a fact. Without Punjab, there is no way you can that easily conquer Delhi. Okay. So, Ghazni paved the way for conquer, uh, conquer of uh, India, for Muhammad of Khor. Both of them were not really concerned with religion. Both Ghazni and Ghori, they were not conducting wars or anything based on religion. They actually allowed Hindu, uh, you know, jarred soldiers in their own army. Some of their chiefs were Hindus. Again, neither of them were concerned with religion or Islam. Once a ruler submitted, he was allowed to rule over his territories for some, some more other reasons. This is another common character. Once they defeat, they do not annex it immediately. More or less, most of the time, that ruler was allowed to continue as, ruler, as long as he accepted the suzerainty of the king. Okay, this is the kind of Samantha system, not a, uh, that term we saw yesterday. Okay, this is another common factor. Clear? So now we have to see the final topic for the day, uh, that is the causes of defeat of Rajputs. Okay, final topic, the causes of defeat of Rajputs. Why did the Muhammad uh, of Khor or how did the Muhammad of Khor manage to defeat the strong Rajputs or what were the causes of the defeat of Rajputs? Most of the points you already know. Okay, so it may be stated as an axiom that a country is conquered by another only when it suffers from social and political weaknesses or become economically and militarily backward compared to its neighbors. This is true, right? I mean, we can. This is a very general statement. A country is conquered by another only when it is when it suffers from social, political, economic, or military weakness. Otherwise, that country cannot be beaten. A strong country, which is doing economically fine, which has a pretty good military force, cannot be defeated that easily. Okay. So, some of the recent researches shows that Turks did not have any superior weapons at their disposal as compared to Indians. Okay, they did not have anything superior as compared to Indians. The iron stirrup, which was, you know, which changed the history with, you know, introduction in cavalry, uh, this was very prevalent in India also at that time. Okay, maybe the Turkish horses are superior, but other than that, there was nothing that is, you know, giving any extra advantage for Turks. 
the turkish bows could not uh, could shoot arrows to a longer distance but the indian bows were much more accurate and deadly okay turkish bows had more range but the indian bows bow and arrow you know that right the indian the bow and arrow thing and all okay the indian bows were much more quicker and accurate so there also i mean nothing no not ex, no particular advantage for the turks okay and indian arrows also were used you know dipped in poison and all so it is much more deadly compared to a turkish arrow in one hand the comb uh, in hand to hand combat with uh, swords indian swords were of the best quality in the world okay i mean historically indian steel especially and therefore indian swords are the best quality in the world okay we have studied about that in modern india also uh, we saw that uh, certain kings such as you know uh, hyder ali tipu sultan etc used these indian steel uh, to create superior varieties of swords and also in basically indian swords are one of the best in the world india also had the advantage of having elephants in war okay but perhaps the turks had horses which were swifter and more sturdy as compared to indians that is the only advantage that they could have had so numerically indians were better swords indians were better bows you know almost equal we had elephants in the war picture but still we lost so how did we lose the weakness of indians were mostly social and organizational okay the growth of feudal system or feudalism weakened the administrative structure and military organization of indian states this is true okay the kind of society was feudal i already told you this yesterday and in the previous classes so because of this feudal setup what happens centralization is very or the uh, power of the central authority is very low so there is no large standing army the central authority has to call in armies from the feudal lords during the time of war similarly the revenue collected from these areas goes to the feudal chief which means it is not coming to the central treasury so economically also the central uh, kingdom the empire the monarch is comparatively weaker so in general the feudalism weakened the administrative structure and military organization of indian states the tribal structure of turks and the growth of ikta and khalisa systems enabled them to maintain large armies we will study about ikta and khalisa systems in a bit in the next slide actually but understand that the uh, turks were in a tribal character okay what is the character of a tribe there is a tribe chief and whatever the tribe council decides it's it happens okay that's the kind of uh, system uh, the turks had it's a tribal structure and the growth of ikta and khalisa systems also helps them a lot in maintaining huge armies we will study that in a bit indians were not accustomed to move as an organized body of horsemen which could cover long distances and fight out fight and maneuver this is another backward backwardness india had a good cavalry that is true but we are not trained enough to conduct long distance wars on top of a horse okay cavalry was much more common and much more dominant in central asia than in india in india infantry and you know elephants etc were more common i mean cavalry were, was also there but indian cavalry was not trained as well as the turkish cavalry the social and organizational structure of turks were advantageous for them the ikta system okay let's take one by one ikta and khalisa so the ikta system started growing slowly in west asia it implied that a turkish chief was allotted a piece of land as ikta from which he could collect the land revenue and taxes due to the state and in return he had to maintain a body of troops for the service of the ruler this is the ikta system so the ruler will give you that particular tract of land and you can collect the land revenue from that land but in return for that you have to maintain a body of military a small military body which should be given to the sultan whenever he goes to war or whenever he demands this is the ikta system this was very much beneficiary this was not hereditary which means if any of them messes with it or if any of them fails to keep up with this sultan can transfer that ikta to someone who will take it up 
In India, that was not the case. These kinds of land grants were feudal and hereditary. Okay, it, I mean, unless that person rebel against the Sultan or something, that land is passed down from family to family. I mean, uh, from the, in the same family. Okay, but in the Turkish organization, it was different. Uh, and this was advantageous for the Tur Turkish setup. The Sultan drew revenues directly from a piece of land which was called as Khalisa. This is the second one, Ikta and Khalisa. So Khalisa is a piece of land from which Sultan directly collect taxes. So basically every tax collected in a Khalisa goes to Sultan, goes to the central treasury. So this enabled the Sultan to maintain a huge army because there is a there is ample quantity of Khalisa land. So revenue from that land gives, gives Sultan enough money or enough uh, wealth to maintain a huge standing army. In India's case, this was not there at that time. Okay, many of the Turkish officers were slaves who has been trained for warfare and grew in Sultan's service and on whom the Sultan could place total trust. Another important feature. Okay, these slaves, we might think, you know, uh, slaves are you know, bound to obey everything and it's, it's bad and all. We have heard about all these stories. But in the slave system that existed at that time, Sultan can place absolute trust over slaves. He can trust a slave with his life. That was the kind of trust. And these slaves were, you know, well, very well trained in warfare. And they grew up in Sultan's personal service. Okay, so in terms of personal bravery, these slaves were very, very well trained or, you know, very much trusted and loyal. In India, we had infighting. Okay, one, one person will betray the other and in return, he will betray the other. That goes on. But we can't, you know, com completely neglect or we, can, we can't completely, you know, uh, say that Indian dynamics at that time was very bad and, you know, disloyal and all. Because the India at that time was ruled by Rajputs, as I have already mentioned. And Rajputs are very well known for their bravery. Okay, just like these Turks imbued the Khasi spirit. Khasi spirit means, means what? This, you know, mercenary and, you know, I already explained what a Khasi is at the beginning. So just like the Turks had this Khasi spirit, Rajputs also considered retreating in a battle as a dishonor. So they will, all, they were very brave men, courageous men, they will fight it out. Okay, caste did not, also caste did not prevent Rajput, non-Rajputs or the Kuvarna or the lower caste from taking part in battles so that Rajput armies were larger. Okay, this was the Indian condition. In India, uh, although we had many infightings, still Rajputs were extremely brave. They were extremely loyal to their cause and their you know, honor and all. And they, the, there was no caste restriction or barrier as far as taking, in, but, uh, taking part in a battle is concerned. So even the lower caste people were allowed to participate in battles. So the Rajput armies were usually very large. Problem is still they lost. Okay, so the, what is the problem? The issue is that Rajputs lacked what might be called as a strategic vision. Okay, once the outer bastions of India, Kabul, Lahore, etc. had fallen to Turks, no concerted attempt was made by the Rajputs to recover them. This is a folly. When the Hindu Shahi rulers were facing defeat in the hands of Mahmud of Ghazni, they should have helped. The Rajputs should have helped. Or at least, even at least after the Hindu Shahi rulers fell, Rajputs should have came together and made sure the northwestern boundary was safe. They did not do this. They neglected this. They lacked this vision. Okay. Similarly, little effort was made to push the Ghaznavids out of Punjab. Again, true. The Ghaznavids established themselves in Punjab and it is from there Muhammad of Ghor was able to attack Delhi and conquer it. If Rajputs organized together and managed to push away the uh, Ghaznavids from Punjab, then this would not have happened or the story would have been different. This was also not done. Okay, so that kind of visionary or that kind of insights was not there among the Rajputs at that time. They paid very little attention to the developments outside, especially to Central Asia, which had often played a key role in shaping India's history. This is also true. Had they been updated or had they focused on what was happening elsewhere in the world, especially Central Asian region, they would have known that the Khwarizmis were, you know, defeating the, uh, the Kasnavids 
and Gwarismes are, you know, basically pushing the Ghaznavids towards India. If they had known that, or if they have cared about that, they could have organized themselves into a coalition against the Ghaznavids to prevent such incursions into India. But since they completely ignored the Central Asian politics and ignored everything that is happening outside India, they lacked the vision to carry forward uh, their activities. So basically, from this chapter, the most important takeaway is that Central Asian dynamics had a lot to do with India. Basically, it is Central Asian politics which more or less shaped India in the medieval times. Okay, they, these Ghaznavids, these Gurids, etc., came to India solely because of Central Asian politics. Okay, I mean they came for plunder and all that is true, but they they came here and started to establish their power in India and started to settle in India. Prominently because what was happening in, or because of what was happening in Central Asia. So the Central Asian politics and dynamics had a lot to do in shaping of medieval India. Okay, so here we stop today's session. I hope you have understood or at least got some picture of what I told you today. Uh, take a break and you know when you get time, read this slide once more so that you will get you know you, everything will stick to your mind. Okay, let me see if there are any questions. In the ancient Mauryan Empire, till Mughal's rules, can we say that we find stability in centralized rule of these rulers as when any kingdom collapsed? Decentralization led invasion from outside India. Uh, decentralization caused invasion from outside India is uh, can be argued, okay? But uh, because I mean, there was certain kind of decentralization during some other kings also. Okay, for example, during the time of Harshavardhana, we or say some of during the time of Guptas, etc. We see some kind of feudalism. It is considered as one of the factors that led to the collapse of these empires. But still, uh, you, you are correct. Okay, you are correct in assessing that centralization or a very powerful central monarchy was uh, always set the tone of India during those times. Powerful emperors like you know Mauryans uh, and the Mughals, etc., etc. They were very. They had a very strong monarch. Who managed, uh, who, you know, who were able to keep all these together. Okay. Okay, these firecrackers are going on because of the, you know, uh, our ministers were taking an oath today. Okay, Kerala ministry is signing in today. That is the noise that you are hearing. Anyway, uh, of these rulers, and then kingdom collapse. Okay, so uh, Satya, your observation is very much correct. We will study more about that when we talk about ancient India and all. We will be studying Mughals also. So that is a very good observation. That is a general pattern. This is the this is one of the biggest drawbacks of monarchy. The monarchy is strong as rule as the monarchy is strong. The moment the monarch falls, it, it is completely chaos. There are succession battles. Then the, you know, some of the nobles will try to take over power. Some of the uh, you know further furthest placed uh, you know samantas or feudatories will try to assert their own independence and all these things will happen. Okay, so yeah, that, we will conclude it here today. Thank you for uh, all for joining. If you have not liked the video, please do so. Please share with your friends also. Uh, I will upload the PDF of this class in the Telegram channel. The link is shown here. Uh, the next class will be probably day after tomorrow. Okay, if you have any queries, please feel free to ask me. You can directly ping me through the WhatsApp or Telegram or Instagram. All the links are given in this Telegram channel. You can look it, check it out. So that's it from me today. Thank you everyone. See you. Bye-bye.